Hi everyone, Mike Malatesta here and welcome back to the How Did Happen podcast. On this podcast, I dig in deep with every guest to explore the roots of their success, to discover not just how it happened, but why it matters. My mission is to find and share stories that inspire, activate, and maximize the greatness in you. On today's episode, I have an amazing conversation with Paul Hutchinson, an executive director of one of the highest grossing films in the theaters today, The Sound of Freedom a film that highlights one of the largest child rescue missions in history. We talk about the 70 undercover missions Paul's participated in to combat and liberate sex trafficked children, how he came to the decision to do that work while he was leading one of the largest real estate investment companies in the United States and maybe the world, I don't know, Bridge Investment Group, his superpower as a relationship chameleon, and why he's never wanted to be a regular anything. We're not talking about a civil war here and rising up against the government and all this crap. We're talking about a war on evil. And there are so many good people that are willing to stand up and say, you know what? We're gonna do a revolution, a revolution against trafficking. That's what we're gonna do. We're Mm. gonna do a revolution against whatever this evil is that's happening to our children in our own homes. That's how this problem is fixed. This conversation is raw, eye-opening, a little bit, okay, a lot creepy, and hopefully more than a little optimistic too. I hope you enjoy this great conversation. Hey, Paul, welcome to the podcast. Thanks, Mike. Appreciate you taking the time to have me on. Yeah, I've been looking forward to this. I heard you first on Dave Will's EO360 podcast. Dave is a good friend of mine. And I tell you, the, the thing that got my attention first was the Bridge Investment Group thing, because I, my wife and I happen to be investors in Bridge. So <laughs> as soon as I heard that name, I was like, oh, I know that name, familiar with that. But that was only, obviously, that's only a very small part of your story. And folks, for you, for those of you listening, I gave you a taste of what we talked about today, but now I'm going to give you a little bit more information about Paul so you can get as excited as I am about this podcast. So Paul Hutchinson, over a period of 10 years, Paul has led and played a key part in over 70 undercover rescue missions to liberate trafficked children. The horrific reality of combating the fastest listen to this, the fastest growing criminal enterprise in the world motivated Paul to use all his available resources to eradicate this evil from the earth. Even as I read that sentence, Paul, my skin is crawling a little bit. That is so disturbing. The fastest growing criminal enterprise. Yeah. And That's so why the movie's doing so well. People are people are like, wow. Yeah. Yeah. They got to be like, wow, in a really weird, like just smack across the head with a baseball bat. Wow. Anyway, let me continue. So after a decade of child rescue missions, which, which by the way, we're going to talk about, it's super fascinating. Paul realized that the only way to fix the problem is to take away the demand, which is icky. If we could turn back the clock and help the perpetrators heal before they ever passed on their trauma to others, we would save millions of children. Paul is the founder of the Child Liberation Foundation and Liberate Humanity. He has received a ton of doctorate and other degrees. If you go to his LinkedIn page or uh, his website, which is, is it official, paulhutchinson.com? Or- Paul Hutchinson Official, yeah, Paul paulhutchinsonofficial.com. Hutchinson. Uh-huh. Okay, and that's all Paul's socials as well, as far as I know. If you go there, you will see, I didn't I didn't want to embarrass you by reading through all of them, and you probably heard them so <laughs> many times, but there is so many things there, including being knighted and all other kinds of things. Super cool. Here's what Paul referenced. He's the executive director of the Sound of Freedom movie, which just recently came out last weekend. We're at July 12th, 2024. So last weekend, it was the highest grossing film in, is it the United in the States? In the nation. Yeah, probably in the world, because- you know, the U.S. kind of leads all those movies, but yeah, yeah. The, the numbers came out here in the U.S. And just for reference, folks, the, the new Indiana Jones movie came out last weekend. So if you Same can just day. imagine, <laughs> imagine that. That's so amazing. Uh, the film highlights one of the largest child rescue missions in history with over 120 victims being liberated. And Paul's role in the rescue is played by the producer of the film, which is Eduardo. How do you say the last name? Verostigi. Verostigi. Eduardo Verosky, yeah. 
And that rescue mission in Colombia set the course of Paul's lifetime focus on helping real humanity. And prior to all this relatively insignificant work that Paul's doing, he was a co-founder of Bridge Investment Corporation and Bridge Investment Group Partners. Bridge is, a publicly, is publicly traded on the New York Stock Exchange and has more than $48 billion under management. So Paul, I start every podcast with the same simple question, and that is, how did it happen for you? Um, I decided that it would. Okay. From, uh, from an early age, I decided that I was going to make a powerful, positive impact in the lives of others. I, I, I knew that I had one life to live and, um, and I was going to do the best, or at least I was brought here for a purpose, you know, whether that was a hundred lives or one life or whatever, but I knew that I had a great mission. And, mm -hmm. um, as a child, a young child, I, I wanted to be a, a brain surgeon and then I changed that to surgeon. I realized that the mind, I could heal the world, but then I realized later that healing the heart was really the key to healing the mind. And so fast forward, I got in a major car accident, severed the tendons in my hand, didn't know if I'd have the ability to be a, a surgeon. They said, you could be a regular doctor. I said, I don't want to be a regular anything. <laughs> I mm -hmm. said, you know, the reason I wanted to be a surgeon is, is I, uh, I wanted to specialize in really, really, uh, and, and, and I wanted to be a pediatric cardiologist. I wanted to be a heart surgeon on children. But fast forward, I changed my major to business and finance. And the answer to the riddle on how to become successful in business, how to make a massive impact in the world, the charity side, everything else, was actually a meeting I had in my early 20s, where I was introduced to a man by the name of Jerry Prine. Jerry had never graduated from elementary school. He read on a third grade level, but he was the inventor of countless medical devices, uh, the original software that Siri voice recognition was built upon. And he said, Paul, he said, he said, you could have an IQ at 200 if you want it. And I'm like, uh, no, I don't, I don't think you can change your IQ. He goes, no. He said, the difference between me and you is that I listen better than you. Hmm. I said, you listen better than me? And I put my hand to my ear and he said, no, I listen better than you. And he put his hand on his heart. He said, when you realize that we were all born with the ability to feel and recognize that spirit of truth and you learn to follow it, it will guide you in your life in ways you can't imagine. And so I, I really took that to heart and started really tuning in to what my life mission would be and, and, and and even building a successful company by, by listening after you've identified what those goals were, I was able to put together a power team of people who created a massive success in the business. Um, however, my greatest success in my life was, was not financially. The, the thing that I point to as my greatest success is my number one, my family, in, in those relationships. But number two, my philanthropic work. I, I, I realized a long time ago that if I worked really hard at my business goals, I had decent results. Mm -hmm. But if I worked really hard and tried to have a powerful, positive impact in the lives of others, then my, my business goals would just blossom. They would just blow up. And, and you can call it karma. You can call it God. You can call it whatever you want to. There's a higher power very interested in us doing good and making a positive impact in the world. And so, yes, from, a, from some degree, my philanthropic work was somewhat selfish because I had so many amazing blessings that came in my life because of my focus on charity work. And so I... I, I served on many different boards of different of, of, of child related charities. I I helped to uh, raise the money for them, the aquarium in Utah, and I served with the the uh, One Life at a Time and and uh, the Ronald McDonald House. I helped with that. I was on the Make a Wish board of directors for seven years, mm -hmm. which was a beautiful experience, beautiful organization. But after seven years, I I, uh, I was the incoming chairman in our in our area in, in Make a Wish when I got a phone call from our attorney general, and he said, "Paul, he said, I know you've been very involved in child related charities." He said, "I need to talk to you about something." He said, "It's the fastest growing criminal enterprise in the world, and good people don't know that it's happening." 
I said, really, what, what, what are we talking about? He said, he said, uh, he said, I'm talking about human trafficking. He said, in particular right now, I want to talk to you about child trafficking. I'm like, child, like people selling children, like for what? I couldn't even imagine that would be happening. And he said, he said, Paul, he said, there's more today. And I'm not talking about just children being abused at home, which is horrible and huge. He said, I'm talking sold human beings. There's more today than all 300 years of the transatlantic slave trade put together. And he introduced me to a Homeland Security agent who had identified some children in Latin America that he wanted to rescue, but his boss wouldn't authorize the, the operation and wouldn't give him the money. And so he needed to pull together some investors to help make that happen. So I, we, we introduced him to some of my people and I helped as well. And uh, Glenn Beck helped as well, some other really great people. And then a few weeks later, he called me. And he said, Paul, he said, I'm in Cartagena, Colombia. There's not just 20 children here. There's more than 50. And there's more than 100 children in the surrounding areas that are tied to similar trafficking rings. He said, we believe we can rescue all of these children on the same day at the same time. And this is this is the premise of where the movie came from, the Sound okay. of Freedom movie. And uh, and your listeners can go and watch it on, uh, we're over 2,000 theaters and we're packed every day. It's the number one grossing film in America right now of these new releases. And um, and so the the real backstory is, I, I he said, he said, I believe we can rescue all 100 children. I said, great. I said, what, what, how can I help? I said, you, you need me to write a check? He goes, no, I need you. Can you be in Colombia in two days? He said, the head trafficker down here has an island he wants to develop into a child brothel sex resort, similar to a Jeffrey Epstein type of a thing. He said, we, we, we know he's connected with all these other traffickers. What we need you to do is fly in, meet with him, convince him you're willing to fund his project under one condition. He has to have a party for you and your buddies within a couple weeks, bringing all of the children that he has control over. And if you're happy with that party, then you'll fund his project. This is how we were getting him to bring all the children together at the same time so we could mm. rescue them all. And it ended up being the largest child rescue mission in one day in history that I know of at the time, 127 children. And so that's that's the background and, and where the name came from. I I was I was there, these I won't go into all the details, but we could hear a bunch of the children crying, and it was just just heart-wrenching seeing these children that were being brought in and we put them in a separate part of the house and the the um the agents came and stormed the party and arrested everybody the child protective services people came in with the children and they started laughing and and to just settle the the children down singing with these kids and that sound of freedom was the most beautiful sound that i ever heard i imagine and i i, I turned to the attorney general and i said bro i said i, I spent my whole life making rich people richer. I said, I want to make a difference. I want to, I want to, what do you need? Can I write you a check? And he said, Paul, he said, unfortunately, the majority of demand for this horrible act in second and third world countries comes from wealthy, connected business owners and celebrities, people like you. He said, I can't teach my Navy SEALs how to wear a $4,000 suit and a $50,000 watch and negotiate a multi-million dollar deal. He said, and I don't know of any successful business owners who's had the training that you've had. He said, if you're willing to be the bait, I'll change your whole life. And so that was my first of now 70 undercover rescue missions. I had no social media, no interviews, nothing for the last 10 years, because I, that's where my focus was. We needed mm -hmm. that Homeland Security agent went, went public on CNN, ABC, and he's been kind of the face of a lot of those rescues. But a lot of the behind the scenes heroes were a lot of these Navy SEALs and Green Berets and guys that I worked with on these operations. So that's a that's a quick history of yeah. where we are from here. And then you as a host can kind of take us where your audience wants to go deeper on any of those issues. Yeah. Well, I'm going to take you where I want to go, if that's okay. The, <laughs> that works, Mike. So, I mean, you sort of glossed over that as if that was something that wasn't an extraordinary ask of you. I mean, you're a business person, you're running a, or you're, co-running a big, very large company. You're serving on all these 
boards, you're fi- you're philanthropic, you have an interest in child causes uh, or you know charities mm-hmm. that support. That's a heck of a long way, Paul, from being asked to basically be uh, a, an undercover agent in this. That's that's a long way from being an undercover agent. So <laughs> I want to know, or I would really like to know, when you were asked, how did you process? That first of all, how did you process it with your family and stuff? And then how did they get you ready to get into this situation? I mean, you said, you know, I mean, yes, you've had a lot of big meetings in your life and done a lot of deals, <laughs> but it's a little, it seems a little different. Yeah. Right. Right. Yeah. So tell us, tell so, us how that happened. Two or three things. First yeah. of all, the uh, attorney general knew that I had taken a lot of courses and training on hand-to-hand combat, and I was super efficient with the weapons, et cetera. I've taken courses on on edge weapons training and improvised weapons training and on Krav Maga and, and all of these things, um, number one. Number two, um, he was in a meeting with me a more than a year before that, where uh, a representative at a, at a charity that we were working with was from uh, from the Pentagon, used to be a recruiter for the CIA, watched me after four days. He, he and I and Sean were sitting down and he said, he said, Mr. Hutchinson, I've, I've uh, as you know, I've been a recruiter for over 20 plus years with uh, CIA. He said, I, I've been watching you for the last three days and I think your country could use your talents. And I'm like, well, what talents are those? And right. he said, um, he said, uh, about one in every 12 million have the are, are, are a true chameleon ability to to go in. And he said, I saw you in seconds break down the barrier of communication, become best friends with a bum on the street, a billionaire and a runway model. And they they wanted me to go in and do some um, undercover work in, in, uh, in Dubai with some dirty money guys. And I actually turned them down. I didn't want to put my life in danger. Fast forward more than a year later when um, Sean Reyes was in a meeting with... Uh, I wasn't there, but I was told the story with uh, Josh Romney and and Tim Ballard and others. And Tim was saying, "Hey, I need to I need to find somebody who can play this role. I I want to go public. I want to beat my face out there. And so I need somebody who can play this role." And and uh, Sean Reyes said, "Oh, well, have you ever met Paul Hutchinson?" And purportedly, Josh Romney said, "Oh, Paul would be perfect." And I, I told him later, "I don't think that's a compliment. You guys both think that I'd be a good undercover pedophile, <laughs> you know? <laughs> what is that about?" But or that, or that you're a chameleon who can basically, you know, exactly tell anybody exactly. anything and they believe you, right? It's kind of <laughs> exactly scammy, so, right? <laughs> I, I exactly. I said, yeah. I don't, I don't know that that's a that's a compliment there, but. Then is what happened when when I got that call from the Homeland Security agent. He said, Paul, he said, I'm, I'm here in Colombia and I have these children. And I'll answer your question this way. I got a call an hour later from my business partner, John Pennington. He was the co-founder of Bridge Investment Group with me. And John said, Paul, I, uh, I heard from Don what you just agreed to on your on your phone call about going to Colombia. He said, have you have you thought this through? Mm. He said, this is really dangerous. This is this is I mean, he said, you're set. You could you, you could sell out today, buy an island, be happy the rest of your life. And I said, John, would I really be happy if I bought an island, if I bought a yacht, if I bought some jets? What it what would that make me happy? I said, and tell me this, if I was doing something else dangerous tomorrow, if I was, if I was climbing Everest tomorrow, you and I would have the same conversation. He goes, yeah, we probably would. I said, and when I'm, when I'm 95 years old and I'm looking back on my life and I say, I climbed this mountain and I built this multi-billion dollar company and I helped rescue this many children from slavery, which of them matters at mm-hmm. all? He said, you're right. He said, if your skills can be used to help find these children, then you should go. And asking to help fund that mission isn't what changed my life. Mike, the thing that changed my life was there's a little girl that's depicted in the movie. They called her princess. My, 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 um, um, the traffickers called her princess when they're introducing her to me. She's kind of the main theme of the, of the movie and trying to find this little girl. But in the, the real story, they had shown me this picture of this little girl in my first meeting, this little 11 year old. Hmm being sold for the first time, scared to death. And the thing that changed my life 
forever is sitting at this quote party when the traffickers bring out these children and this little girl standing in front of me scared to death her makeup was running because she was scared and she was crying she was shaking she was looking at me like i was that monster and i, I everything in me wanted to just say I, i'm not that guy you're going to see your parents again right Don't she worry. had no idea yeah she okay, had no right. idea that we were the good guys and she was looking at me with that fear in her eyes and i i made a commitment at that moment to myself to that little girl and to God, that I would do everything in my power to eradicate that from the face of the earth. There wasn't anything more evil than I could think of than that little girl being sold in that way. And so since that time, I have led or been a, played a key part in over 70 undercover rescue missions in 15 countries. And That's do those, what changed my life. Do those 15 countries include the United States? We have um, we have operators in the U.S. now. For a long time, when I was doing undercover, um, we had we had some of the foundations that I had helped to fund that were funding operations here in the U.S. I I went on a couple stings with the Attorney General Office and whatnot here, but the deep cover was was in second and third row countries okay. because of the fact that that's where my role fit the best. It was. It was these Americans that were going down, wealthy guys going down, putting on these big parties or whatever else. And so, so yes, we did have some pushback in the beginning from some agencies in the U.S. that were like, "Hey, you know, we want to. This is our job. We don't. We don't need help from charity organizations." But in these foreign countries, we would go in, and before you know, they would kind of butt heads with the the u.s agency saying you know this is our job don't get in our way but we could come in as a private foundation and say listen we will work with you we will work under your laws we will report to you we will pay for everything we will do all the work we will present these guys you take that down the takedown your people will think you're heroes because they won't even know we're involved they'll they'll think that we got arrested with these bad guys and in doing so it allowed us to have some beautiful synergy with these Mm. these uh the federal police in these different countries but even as you were doing that because you mentioned in the columbia uh example that you had the seals with you and did you always have u.s uh service protection not not, not active so these these uh, seals okay. these navy so seals private. Raised, they're all they're all retired okay so right. yeah we we uh now on that uh on the columbia rescue what had happened is the the, we had we had my guys at my party were former Navy SEALs, Green Berets. They were operators. We had we had a bunch of CTI agents, which were the Colombian federal agents that were some of them were undercover. There are maids and our waiters, our cooks, and a bunch of them to storm the island at the right time. And then those guys were watching our guys watching us. And then and then an outside perimeter, we did have some. U.S. government assets that were watching simply because the Homeland Security agent had just retired from his job and he still had some connections there, et cetera. Okay. So they were watching them. But in a lot of these operations, we don't work with active U.S. assets. We have we have retired ones that are there helping us. And how, Paul, did you create a persona for yourself that was believable? And I I get the that you can act mm -hmm. like I can you can mm -hmm. act like a rich guy. Because you are, cause that's what you are. But how did like they? I'm assuming they check you out. Like it's like it's yeah. So so first things first, and this is yeah. actually a funny story. I um on the very first mission. This might worry you as a as an investor in Bridge, <laughs> but on that very first mission, when Tim <laughs> called and said, "Hey, I uh, I need you here in Colombia in two days," I didn't have time to set up a, a profile. I went down as Paul Hutchinson. Right. So these okay. guys looked me up online and and saw my background that and I didn't have a big social media profile. I had I had some. I had a little bit online, but they looked online and saw, you know, that I was the founder, all this stuff. And so that gave all the credibility they needed to to bring in all of these children, which ended up being what the movie was about. Fast forward after that mission, when I was asked to continue and go doing deep cover work. 
I, I, I told my personal assistant, I said, Kitty, I need all of my everything online about the real me taken down. You know, I, I talked to the board of directors, told them I'm taking my face down from bridge. I'll still be here. I'll still raise the money. I'll still, you know, uh, help out in the investment committees, all of that stuff. But I can't have my face online anymore. And then I removed everything on my social media, my Facebook, mm. my Instagram, all of these things, removed all of that, and then set up a fake profile. In fact, I I, I became Paul Stone. In fact, the, the story of how I became that is what's funny. So I, I told my assistant, Kitty, I said, listen, going undercover, I need to have a different persona. There's, there's, a, there's hundreds of millions of Pauls in the world. And so I want to stay as Paul. That's not a big deal. But I can't be Paul Hutchinson. So I'll set up a new profile under uh, Paul Johnson instead. And she's sitting there typing and she stops and she looks up at me and she said, you have a chance to redefine yourself and you're going to be Paul Johnson. <laughs> she said, how about Paul Stone? <laughs> she types that out. Nice. So, so we put together this, this uh, fake profile under Paul Stone um, in the first profile I was, I was the rich guy. I was the, I, I had a bunch of pictures with me in front of Ferraris and Lamborghinis and yachts and stuff that I, I didn't ever put on my social media because I didn't want to piss guys off, you know, mm -hmm. but it was a great persona for this playboy that was going down there for these things. So she put all of that up online. We had, a, had some, uh, some guys build a, a, a fake web page for me, a Paul Stone Capital and all of this stuff so that I would be this guy that was a real estate guy because that's what I knew in these missions and whatnot. And uh, so Paul Stone Capital is what they put together. Mm. And um, I had business cards. I had phone numbers. I had all of this stuff. And a few of these operations got super dangerous. And if I didn't have all of that new stuff memorized, I wouldn't be here today. And that's, mm. a, that's a whole other story of some of those uh, undercover operations where it got pretty dicey. But uh, but that's what we did in setting up those social media profiles. Thank you for that. And were there any of these 70, like, I, I'm assuming that there's a lot of coordination, like somebody has to make the connection with these people. Someone has to introduce you. You got to set up all the things you talked about, all the people, the perimeter, the situation itself. What's involved in doing so, this? So the first year as Paul Stone, yeah, I... The, the foundation we were working with at the time had had guys that would go in deep cover and they would they would connect on the ground at two in the morning when in in downtown you know in Acapulco and connect with the guys who were selling the children there and then then they would show them my profile and these are these are former CIA guys and art guys and, and guys who who had had a lot of experience in that space. They would show my my profile. These guys would look at my my web page. They would look at my my social media. They'd go, "Oh wow, yeah, that guy is the guy that we're looking for." So then they would bring out their children for this this party, so to speak. I would fly in, and um, and they would have a quick meeting many times with them. We had coordination with the federal agents that were there undercover to make sure that I was safe. I was I was picked up at the airport usually by former Navy SEALs and Green Berets that were my real bodyguards and my show bodyguards, so to speak. And um, and then everything would be all pre-coordinated where we we had a place for the party, so to speak. We would have undercover cameras that were there that were set up so that the children never had to stand trial and witness. We mm. uh, we had the bad guys saying exactly why that that's a dark conversation, Mike. Yeah. And we have to on camera have these guys tell us exactly why the children were there, what they were willing to do, how much they cost, and all of this stuff. That's that's what we used as evidence, turning it in. Now, fast forward after a little over a year of doing the that deep cover or the undercover work as Paul Stone, um, it was decided that the foundation we were working with at the time was concerned that it was too dangerous to be having some of their guys under the foundation doing that deep cover work. And so they wanted me and my team to start doing that 2 a.m. downtown Mexico City, those those kind of operations. So I changed my persona from Paul Stone to Paul Steele because Paul Stone, that would be super dangerous for, for this guy with all of this money to be two in the morning. I, I, I instead began working for a wealthy boss. And so okay. I would go in with these guys. And so the majority of my missions for the last 10 years 
I was actually deep cover. I was two in the morning, downtown Port-au-Prince, Haiti, connecting with the the worst people you can imagine that were selling these children, telling them that my boss is coming in a few weeks and and we're going to put together a, a, an event with him on his yacht or on the beach or whatever else. And that's where we would rescue all the children. Okay. So you became the, the uh, supposed liaison between them and yeah. so so two in the morning these dark meetings uh, it's like you're just stepping in further 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 like it's one thing what you described in columbia you go there you, you know you do it now now you're basically putting yourself i mean you're putting yourself at risk there now you're you're, Super you're yeah. yeah so tell me what's going through your mind when you show up at these places and can you give me an example of like something that just went uh, really wrong without you getting yeah. injured, of course, but just like, holy crap, how'd I get out of that one? Absolutely. So there's a lot of those, a lot, a lot of them. Many times the the traffickers who were selling these children were escaped convicts from the US um, that that were that that went across the border, that went into the Dominican Republic, went into Haiti, went into Mexico, went into Peru, wherever. And it's amazing how many times the kingpin in those areas was uh, was was former uh, fugitive in the U.S. that was that was abroad and selling these kids, and so that makes it dangerous by itself. Um, I had one situation where I had I had met with this this trafficker, and he's he's like. Uh, uh, he was obvious king of this entire region. Everybody was cowering to him. He has shown us some children and he calls me and he goes, he said, pa, Pablo, I have to meet you. I'm like, okay, okay, let's meet. And when we meet, I say, you're going to go show, show me. Because I, I tell them each, I say, listen, my boss will kill me and my whole family if I taste the candy before the party, but I have to verify that you have, have it. So I'll give you $100 for each one. This, this way we can get eyes on the kids. They will take us to where they're holding them so that they can get that $100 for each one that we can see. We can geotag that location so the feds can go in and, 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 and do this thing there mm. instead of having to bring the kids out or whatever else. So if we can get them to take us to where they have the kids – or bring those children out where we can tag their car and have the federal agents follow them. That's that's really the key. And so he calls me and he goes, Pablo, he said, we, we meet. He goes, you know, I'm the king, right? I said, yeah, I know that you're, I mean, he, I said, what do you mean? He goes, I'm the boss. I said, oh yeah, you're the boss of this whole area. He said, every boss has a boss and I'm going to take you to see my boss. And so we go in and this guy is man in charge. I mean, he's got $2,000 shoes on. I can see multiple guys with eyes on us with, with guns that were mm -hmm. behind that tree, behind that building, et cetera. And um, the conversation got pretty heated and he demanded $2,000 before we even get things started. I didn't have the cash there, went back to the safe place, brought him back out and and I'm I'm paying out this cash to him. Because he's the kingpin that's going to set this, that's, that's going to set up the, the event, connect us to all the other traffickers, et cetera. And, and then he said, he goes, he goes, he goes, give me your business card. I'm like, okay, I pull out my card and I give it to him. Holding my business card of my Paul Steele mm -hmm. recover, yeah. right? He holding my business card, he says, What is your phone number? Smart guy, right? Boom. I I got, gave him my phone number that my undercover one I had it memorized. Yep, he goes, what's sure. your address? Boom. And then he says, pull out your phone. Show me your phone. And I show him my phone. He takes his phone and dials that address. That's I mean, dials the, number, the phone number yeah. that's on there. Yeah, yeah. If I didn't have my undercover phone number matched up with my iPhone so it would ring everything, we would be dead right there. He dials my number. Boom. It rings on my phone. He smiles. He goes, I like you. He goes, let me show you. And he takes us over to, he had this black truck that was lowered with these rims and he opens up the doors and there's these three children in there scared yeah. to death. This guy ended up bringing 24 children. And one of them was this, that, that he was connected with was this 13 year old American girl that was traveling with her sister and taken in by the traffickers. So anyway, there's, um, that was super dangerous and it's happened a lot. Yeah. Now, answer to your question, how I'm feeling, and, and, and this isn't a religious thing. This is just a deal I have with my creator. I feel safer in those situations than I do sitting in my office in, in Salt Lake City. I, I believe wholeheartedly that I think that God looks down at what we're doing in business. He's all right, you adults deal with that. He sees what's happening with these children and says, no way. 
If I've got good people willing to do the work, I'm going to pave the way. And I felt that every single time. Huh. Felt that barrier of protection because we were we were in the darkest recesses of hell pulling yeah. these children out. How do you square that? How do you square that thinking with if that were true, and I'm not questioning your thinking, yeah. but if that were true, how many, why so many of these people are doing this kind of thing? Well, God, God doesn't take away, he, he, doesn't, he doesn't take away our free choice. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Everybody has that. Everybody's got free choice. And see, and, and that's what my new mission is, Mike. Yeah. From, from here on, for, for, for the last 10 years, I was, I, we were pulling 10, 20 children out at a time and rescuing these kids. And I looked at the numbers, the end of last year, the beginning of this year, and I realized there's more children being sold today than there was 10 years ago. So if my goal was to eradicate child trafficking, I wasn't doing a very good job. Right? Where does that kind of Some, data come from, Paul? I'm sorry to interrupt you, but where does that kind of data? Oh, there's just like, there's how do you, a bunch of online, you know, estimates and stuff. It's hard to really find, and I mean, that's what I was thinking. Be how if who you can't get anyone to say, oh yeah, I've got a thousand people. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> exactly. These are online estimates of, okay. of things that are growing, um, and and those those numbers range from you know eight million, ten million, twelve million, whatever else. These are just children in in this type of slavery. There's hundreds of millions that are in in underage work camps and things like that. But sure. this kind of slavery. Yep. And I I took a step back and I said, okay, if every time we're pulling twenty children out of hell, we're creating a vacuum because there's still a demand there. I need to figure out this demand side. I've got to figure that out. If that and 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 I realized that in doing that. I was done. I was done doing undercover. I needed to focus my energy on creating awareness and fixing the demand. And so for a long time, I thought that the demand was coming from, from hardcore pornography addictions where somebody you know, got super addicted. They, 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 they want something harder to have that same fix. And for some of them, harder is a little bit younger, a little bit younger. Pretty soon they're fantasizing about things they wouldn't have even thought was attractive five years ago. Mm. I've realized that even that is a symptom. That's a symptom of a much bigger problem. And the bigger problem is this. Literally one in every four women in the world have been a victim of sexual violence as a child. Roughly 40 to 50% of women at some time in their life, but a fourth of all women as a child, in fact, men, it's a little bit lower. It's about one in every five have been a victim at some time in their life. But of those, 25% of them, roughly 200 million men on this planet, it was under the age of 10 years old. So here's what's happening, Mike, in, in a nutshell. We've got generational trauma that is creating these illicit behaviors. So somebody doesn't just grow up in a healthy home and a healthy mind and healthy everything else and, and just decide he's gonna go to Columbia and participate as a, as a pedophile. There's some kind of trauma going on there. And for a long time, I, I, I would sit in front of these traffickers and everything in me wanted to just find a gun and just take them out, right? They're wasting my oxygen. But then I realized if I could have either, if I had a choice between a gun or a time machine, I would actually take the time machine and take them back a year, five years, 10 years before they ever, ever hurt a child and figure out what the crap was going through their mind. What kind of trauma that was unresolved that they were dealing with themselves. Here's the numbers, Mike, of, of, of all of the people who have experienced that kind of trauma as children, most of them in their own home, Two thirds of them, God bless them. They are they're figured out. They're a good husband, good father, good. But one out of three, one out of three become contact offenders themselves. So one out we, of three, as this, one out of three, and they're not just abusing one child, right? It's upwards of a hundred children sometimes. And so this is a massive explosion in the number of people each generation who have experienced that kind of trauma. So. If we can say, okay, yes, once you've raped a child, you are wasting my oxygen, right? You're done. Go to jail. St don't ever get in a position where you can pass your trauma on again, where you can hurt innocence again, period, right? Now, hopefully there's some room for redemption there. Hopefully, you know, I can, they can, they can find a place in their heart where they can feel some remorse and, and, and but at the same time, I don't want to risk them hurting another child on the other side. 
what if we could take the hundreds of millions of people who are dealing with childhood trauma in some way, who some of them it comes out in low self-esteem or anxiety or, 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 or PTSD, whatever it is, some of them, it comes out in, in passing that trauma on. If we could love them and help them before they pass it on, we will save millions of children. So that's what liberating humanity is all about. My, my, um, um, social media profiles are all liberating humanity. I'm, I, it's not about Paul Hutchinson. Yeah, mm -hmm. you can find me on Paul Hutchinson official, but it's liberating dot humanity dot, um, in, in, uh, uh, my social, my IG and my Facebook, all of those things, because that's what my mission is. How do we help people break free from those self-imposed limits, from the anxiety, from the trauma of their past, wash themselves free of that, not define themselves by it, and move on to, to live a healthy life? That's the only way that we're going to fix this problem. Let me, let me ask you two questions about that, Paul. So it makes sense, right? The earlier you get to somebody the better opportunity, whether it's to educate them or to help them deal with some type of trauma, the earlier you get to them, the better outcome they'll likely have. But let me start with the people that you experienced when you're doing this undercover work or that you've, you know, you mentioned Jeffrey Epstein, you know, people who are, you know, grown ass adults, right? They, they know, they know right from wrong. Doesn't matter what their trauma has been in life. They know when they're, you talked about making a decision, you make a decision, they make a choice. They mm -hmm. know it's wrong. But yet they do it, and it's something that's so out of character for some, maybe not all. Like you, I wonder how many people you look at, and I wanted to ask you that question now, now that you've got all this experience, you're really like, hmm, that guy's probably a... But I'm just wondering like, for when, when they get to a certain age and they know this is so, so wrong, and it's so different than their persona is on anything else in life how do you square in your experience how do you square that and then i want to get back to the to the to getting you know getting them help while they're young i think that our biggest enemy is arrogance ego pride and i mean i'm gonna say there, there are so many people who have really big egos and low self-esteem right they've they've got they've got money they've got everything they're the king of the world but but they they loathe themselves for maybe decisions they made in the past or whatever else. And they, they feel like they've already crossed that line, you know, in a, in a religious sense, there's so many people that think, well, you know what, I already effed up in that way. You know, I already slept with somebody before I got married, might as well do worse things. Cause I'm already going to hell. You know, this, this right. self judgment is it creates this super low self-esteem together with ego and pride and arrogance and big checkbooks. And all of a sudden they start going down a dark road. And the second that we look at another human being as anything other than the, the, the divinity within them, we go down a dark road in, in pornography, a perfect example. We, we start looking at, at, at women, not as the divine feminine they are, but as an object. And, and, and when we objectify women and we put them in a place other than who they are, then, then we can easily start putting ourselves in a position where it doesn't matter what we do to them or, or it doesn't matter the pain that we okay. cause, et cetera. And does that stroke their ego or does it help their self-esteem? I'm trying to figure out like if, if you've got a high ego, low self-esteem and you choose to do something like this, which master are you serving? <laughs> in the, in the end, their self-esteem is lower because, because they know innately that they're doing something wrong, right? You know, from a from a uh, from an arrogant standpoint, if you can uh, if, if you can put your dominance on some other person or whatever else, then then that super unhealthy arrogance is something that's going to be inflated even more. Right. And and there's a degree of addiction to that kind of of just dopamine boost of look, I'm. Ex exerting my dominance in this way, which yeah. is just, it's just sick. It That's, is sick and wrong is, in so many ways. That is very, very sick and wrong in very, very many ways. So let's get back to the early help. You mentioned how many, how big the problem is, you know, one in four women, one in five, I wouldn't say women, one in four girls, one in five boys, right? Because this is happening at a, at a young age, mm -hmm. but these, when, when are they in a position to with your organization, when are they in a position to be found or helped? Because 
there's a whole sort of scare intimidation thing around this too. It's like, hey, don't yeah. you ever tell anybody that that this just happened? And then the kid's like, how do you, how do you how do you find them early well, enough and, to and, do it? And here's what's sad about that, Mike: the average age of somebody who comes out and admits that they were abused as a child, the average age is 52 years old. They hold That's on my to age. It. Yeah. Yeah. They hold on to this trauma. They've, they've, they've built their careers. They've raised their children They're they're and, and, and done so in a place of pain of, of dealing with all this stuff. And sometimes it comes out in verbal abuse and, and, and anger issues or, or lack of patience or anxiety, depression, PTSD, or physical and verbal and sexual abuse as well. And so, yeah, that's, that's where it is. If we can catch them in their adolescent years, in their early teens. In fact, the reality is, you know, Everybody at some point, it doesn't matter specific age. There's there's plenty of 60-year-old uncles that are abusing their, you know, the their their nieces somewhere. Right. So, you know, and they may have not have crossed that line until later. So it's not a specific age group. It's it's somehow speaking to their hearts and helping them realize, yeah, this is a, a travesty. This is one of the reasons why we put so much effort into the Sound of Freedom movie is that we needed to wake up the world as to what really was going on and how big of a problem this is so that they could all step back and collectively say, okay, what can we do about this? We can't all be you know, undercover agents and go rescue these kids, but what do we need to do as a society to take away this demand, to fix this problem? Those are the questions we needed people to ask because nobody was talking about child trafficking over the at, at the dinner table it was too dark of a subject mm-hmm. but but the the light at the end of the tunnel with the rescue rehabilitation and reuniting of the children with their families was is such a beautiful light that it makes talking about this somewhat palatable and let let me ask you another disturbing question i've heard you talk about and you mentioned it here some of the strategies that these folks use to recruit and i'll say recruit and maybe you can address those, but I'm also wondering, with those percentages that you mentioned, one in four, one in five, how how often are the parents or the caregivers complicit in getting these children into this for their own benefit, money, or whatever? Take a guess. A lot, I think, right? Because it's especially if- 70% of trafficked children have- a familial member involved in some way, either a family member or somebody that is super close to the family that's involved. And a lot of them sleep in their own beds that night. It's scary. It's people think that the big problem is somebody being snatched and taken to Columbia. No, there is there is trafficking going on in people's backyards right now. And and so, in fact, in Thailand, more than half of the children that we rescued were sold, flat out sold by their own families. And But here in the US, it happens all the time where there's a family member somewhere involved in making money from trafficking people in their family or people in their neighborhood. It happens all mm. the time. And in this, let's just take South America example. Uh, when they're done with these children, what happens to them if they're not saved? If they're not, yeah, that's a that's a sad that's a sad one right there. We've had we've had a number of operations where we we had rescued children that were being sold for organ harvesting. I thought that only happened in you know China and some that happens everywhere. In other words, yeah. it's just like you're done. Yeah, yeah. We 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 did a bunch here here in the U.S. In the U.S. We took some doctors from the U.S. to some areas that were fairly close offshore mm. and did some stings there that they believe a lot of those organs were being sold to people here. And I asked this doctor, I said, I said, I, part of me understands the, you know, the sick road that people go down being addicted to more things and the ego thing. I can, I, I'm starting to see where that demands, where does this demand come from? And he told me this, he said, Paul, he said, do you realize that when a child receives an organ transplant in the US, he said right now, less than 50% of the time, do they have the proper paperwork in place 
to prove where that came from. He said, now I'm not saying they all are coming from traffic children and these organ harvesting things. He said, but if you're a wealthy family and you're 25th on the list and your daughter's going to die before then, and you know, you can go to another country and pay a premium to get on the front of the line. Where is that money going? Hmm. Right. And is it really a child that got in a tragic car accident that that organ is coming to your child or is it coming from an operation like this? Yeah. Like a made to order, like we fulfill yeah. on demand. Ah. Yeah. How do you do this? You have to, you obviously don't have to be doing this kind of work, right? You're committed to it. That's for sure. And yet every day, you know, it's like, are we really making progress? You talked about that. Now, now it's okay. Let's shift because we weren't making progress by taking them one at a time or 20 at a time or hundred at a time. And, and, and I, I think it sounds like a really smart shift. I'm just curious. Like, it's harder to identify the people that you need to reach now because you can't tie them. And I'm speculating here. So you tell me if I'm wrong, but, mm-hmm. but you can't tie them to someone you've identified as a trafficker, for example. Now you're trying to identify children who could potentially become the demand for become either abusers themselves or become the demand for this to continue going on. Back at the time of Abraham Lincoln, yeah. it it wasn't the, the guys like me and my teams that were creating the biggest difference. It was people like you, Mike. It was Harriet Beecher Stowe, who wrote a book called Uncle Tom's Cabin, which was the media of the age. And it created an awareness with good people of what was going on in the South. Mm. And once that awareness happened, they rose up and said, no, not on our watch. Right. Today, in fact, back then, Abraham Lincoln, when he met Harriet, he shook her hand. He said, so you're the little lady that wrote the book that started the Civil War. Okay. We're not talking about a civil war here and rising up against the government and all this crap. We're talking about a war on evil. And there are so many good people that are willing to stand up and say, you know what? We're going to do a revolution, a revolution against trafficking. That's what we're going to do. We're going to do a revolution against whatever this evil is that's happening to our children in our own homes. That's how this problem is fixed. That's the reason we put so much time and money and focus into creating the movie and we are so grateful that there are, there's a massive movement of people that are standing up and spreading this message because this is not going to be one with a bunch of former special operators that are out there just rescuing kids. Yes, that needs to continue. And yes, we've got a bunch of great organizations that are that are killing it. They're doing so good. We have a, one of our Our uh, Navy SEALs, former Navy SEALs, runs an organization. They have an average of 30 pedophiles a month that they're taking down. Now, to show Mm -hmm. you how big of a deal that is, the average pedophile would abuse up to 100 children in their lifetime. Average 100. Wow. Yeah. That's what what I'm told. I don't, you know, but there's, there's, you know, I don't know if that's an up to or average. Let me get the real numbers on that. But this is what I was told by him. And he said, he said, that means that, that, for each one of these guys, that's we're we're saving potentially saving up to a hundred children, mm. right? So there's thousands of children that are being saved by pulling these guys off the street. But more than that, we've got to change the mindset. We've got to help people figure out their crap way before way before it gets to that point. I don't ever want to wait until somebody touches a child, hurts a child, rapes a child. To say, okay, now you're going to jail because now we've got a child that we've got to help rehabilitate the the rest of her life, right? So let's figure out on the chains, you know, our liberating humanity, even the Child Liberation Foundation, we've got a broken chain somewhere in our thing because that's what this is all about. How can we break that chain way before we hurt anybody hurts a child? That's what we've got to figure out as a community. Can I, I'd like to ask you a question on my personal experience and get your advice on it. Is that okay? Yes. So about 15 years ago, I had one of my employees call me on a Sunday and tell me that he was in jail and he needed help getting bailed out of jail. So I said, of course, 
I will come up and I will bail you out of jail. I bail him out of jail. What happened? He said, well, you know, I was playing with my daughter and you know, it got a little rough and my, my wife called the police on me and they arrested me. And I was like, okay, that sounds weird. But I continued to help him. I continued to employ him. I continued to pay because he had to find another place to live for a period of time. And, you know, I continued to do all of these things because I cared about this person. He'd been a good person to me. And, and, and they got back together. And, you know, I don't know what, you know, I don't know what's happened since, but I, but listening to all of this, Paul, I'm thinking to myself, did I do the right thing? Should I have done something differently? Yeah. So I'm just curious what, if you have any advice for me on that. There's a, there's a quote I don't remember all the details of it, but it, it's it, it's the do it anyway quote. You know, people may abuse you, just you know, people may lie to you. You know, trust them anyway. People may have made bad mistakes, love them anyway. Mm-hmm. I've I've done very similar things, Mike. Mm-hmm. I've had uh, I've had people who have who have done super bad things in their past that I thought, you know what, I'm. I'm going to give you a chance. I'm going to employ you. Unfortunately, some of those ended up coming back to bite me, wherein people who are scam artists or who hurt other people, you know, there's something from their moral compass that's messed up that ended up uh, making choices as my employee that affected things financially because I allowed them to just run their moral compass and employ the wrong people and whatever else. And so, you know, I've I've chosen for me personally in my inner circle. I I do I I do judge people according to the fruit on their tree. Mm-hmm. Uh, um, now I'm going to also put systems and programs in place allowing people to get the help that they need, but I'm not going to bring them into my inner circle. So here's the thing: whether I don't, you know, obviously if they let him out on bail, he didn't rape the child. You know, mm-hmm. maybe and 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 the justice system, you know, half the guys that are getting arrested really shouldn't be, and half the guys that are out should be in. You know, it's it's there's there's so many challenges that are there. And so for us to just have this blanket judgment across the board and say, well, since you actually spend a day in jail, then you're obviously a really bad person. No, if if there is for here's the thing. Every single one of us, there's not one person listening to this program. There, every single one of us have effed up in some way in our life, right? Sure. All of us, all of us have, you know, we've acted at a place out of a, a lack of integrity in, in different areas of our life, or we said things that we regretted, or we did things that we regret. Every single one of us have done things that we, we regret doing. Mm-hmm. And, and so if, if you, in fact, the reality is, if you put everybody in jail who has ever, if if every single crime against a child, even just verbal and physical abuse, sexual abuse of every single person that has committed those against children, and even other people, if 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 all the abusers were put in prison, we'd probably have half the planet in prison. Now, maybe that needs to happen, right? Right. But instead, is there a better solution? Right? Is there something that we can do? And and in my opinion, Mike, I actually think you did the right thing. Now, if you were if you were enabling him to to continue and hurt children, I said that's a different story. But it sounds like in his situation, maybe he was you know playing rough and whatever else, and his wife was like, hey, you know, you're you know you. Sh- my opinion is you shouldn't, you shouldn't, you know, there's different parents that have different opinions on whether you spank, spank a child or not. Guess yeah, what? Sure. Me and my sisters, we were, we were spanked. Mm-hmm. You know, some of us were whipped by a belt and we turned out just fine. Today you whip a child with a belt, you're going to jail. Right. And so, so at, you have to ask yourself what, what is moral, what is right, and what do we need to do as a, as a society to help us heal and move forward, but all of us, all of us have room for healing. Well, I appreciate. Thank you for indulging me and in, and weighing in on that. I I do appreciate it. I've been thinking about it the whole time this podcast, like, and I haven't thought of that in many, many, many years. So I I appreciate that. So, Paul, what is the bright side? What what should you you mentioned getting the word out? Of course, that 
I love how you how you related it to a revolution, you know, against trafficking. But what's the bright side that you see? What's the bright side in in the sound of freedom? So much, so much beauty. So, for example, the uh, you can go to liberateachild.org or liberatechildren.org. The Child Liberation Foundation has a a lot of different programs specifically designed for healing. In fact, they have a project right now that they're that they are are launching called Liberating Wings. And uh, it's not just the wings to make you fly, but their physical extensions on the safe houses for the children are the liberating wings. Ah, okay. And um, and these liberating wings are specifically designed for healing modalities. So we have we have a lot of different types of healing modalities that are focused there because a lot of these places they barely have enough of a budget for the beds of the kids and a kitchen and whatever else and you know some therapists that come in and talk to them in this side room. But if we can have something that they can learn and grow and progress with with art therapy with sound bowl therapy with with uh, different breath work exercises and a lot of different things that we can do to help them heal through that trauma that's super beautiful mm -hmm. we also have through the child liberation foundation we we fund other groups we've we've uh, we've we've sent a, a bunch of money to a, a couple foundations that are helping with the adoption of the children because if we can put them into a healthy home, that's great. We we partner with other organizations such as the the Hope of Life Foundation out of Guatemala. Amazing group. These these guys. Uh, if if you have a chance to write a check, if you don't do so to the Child Liberation Foundation, write one to them. These guys have helped over thirty thousand victims, and and mm -hmm. their model is beautiful. They will take they will take these traffic girls and these 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 children from from challenged homes etc that that need to be in the foster home instead of just having them in a big foster home type of a thing they will have donors like me and others that will come down and build homes small beautiful little homes they will take families that maybe have one or two kids that can't afford a home of their own, but but want to expand their family and be in a safe place, they will say, okay, you've got two children. We're going to give you three more. We're going to create a situation where these challenged children have a mom and a dad type of an environment as well. They, they have their therapy and their psychologists and stuff that are there that are helping them, but they're then working on the farm community that's there. It's super healthy and very effective in putting these children in healthy homes and bringing in parents and families that need that extra help and a place to live, et cetera. So it's, it's a beautiful model that's working really, really well. They bought about 3,000 acres continuing to expand. And so that's the beautiful light at the end of the tunnel is mm. the fact that these children can heal, that it does take money. It does take, take resources to make it happen, but we've got the best of the best that are working together in collaboration. So our collaboration is is paying for the foundations that are like these Navy SEALs and Green Berets that are doing the, the, the continuing to do the stings, plus identifying people like Hope of Life that, that are providing this amazing aftercare type of programs, plus finding adoption companies. This is all part of what the Child Liberation Foundation is doing. Got it. Well, thank you for giving us something to, to be positive and optimistic about when it comes to this horrible problem. Paul, is there anything that I haven't asked you that you feel is it's important to to or that you want to talk about before we before we call it a day? I would encourage everybody who's listening to go watch the sound of freedom. It will inspire you. It will motivate you. It will make you cry. But there'll be happy tears as well as the sad tears. And spread that message. And then from there, the next to do is say, okay, what organizations, what foundations do I want to get behind? You know, I'll, I'll tell this because this is important. I made a hard separation uh, uh, with, uh, with the, a clear separation with the foundation that I started with five years ago. The Homeland Security agent who's represented in the movie and the foundation that he represents, we we uh, we separated five years ago. Okay. Um, just different beliefs of, of where the money should go, where the focus should be, where the how how we needed to focus on the rescues, et cetera. And so I, I support anybody who's creating awareness. You know, if they're creating awareness, great. You know, let them run with it. There's no challenges or whatever there. But I will say there are a lot of vetted organizations 
that are really doing the work that are pulling these kids out that are that are creating the aftercare necessary that uh, that we love and support and have on our our list of people that we're donating to okay and it seems like the only way to tackle a problem that's this significant is to have collaborations with anyone and any group and any government and any NGO and anything where you're aligned on the mission of eradicating this problem and present day and going you know back to to getting people before they're helping them with deal with the trauma before they act upon it. Yeah. 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 That's a win-win for all of us. We together, Mike, together we can liberate humanity. That's what this is about. That's where this is all going. That's where there's there's a battle ahead and we're all going to be deciding what side of it we're on. Are we going to figure out how to release our trauma and step into a place of light and and help press this message forward? Or are we going to stick our heads in the sand and pretend like it's not happening? Right. Well, Paul Hutchinson, thank you so much for being on the podcast today. Thank you for making that shift in your life where you decided to commit yourself to this thing that you're uniquely talented to do, it seems like, like starting in, in the undercover and then just taking it to like a whole nother level. And thank you for making the, the movie, The Sound of Freedom. Please go see The Sound of Freedom and let, there's so many great reviews about the movie already. Of course, like I said, like we said, it's a top grossing movie in the US last weekend. Phenomenal. That's got to blow your expectations way out of the water, I would think. And I just really appreciate having had the chance to meet you and and thank you for the, wor the work you're doing. You've inspired me for sure. And I'm sure you've inspired everyone listening. Thank you, Mike. Super grateful for your time and excited to continue to collaborate together. Thank you. And for those of you listening, please act on what you've heard today and do me a favor and maximize the greatness that's within you today and make your future your property, something that you are very proud to own. Hey everybody, thanks for listening to the show. And before you go, I just have three requests for you. One, if you like what I'm doing, please consider subscribing or following the podcast on whatever podcast platform you prefer. If you're really into it, leave me a review, write something nice about me, give me five stars or whatever you feel is most appropriate. Number two, I've got a book, it's called Ownership, How Getting Selfish Got Me Unstuck. It's an Amazon bestseller. And I'd love for you to read it or listen to it on Audible or wherever else, Barnes & Noble, Amazon, you can get it everywhere. If you're looking for inspiration that will help you unlock your greatness and potential, order or download it today so that you can have your very own copy. And if you get it, please let me know what you think. Number three, my newsletter. I do a newsletter every Thursday and I talk about things that are interesting to me and or I give more information about the podcast and the podcast guests that I've had and the experiences that I've had with them. You can sign up for the podcast today at my website, which is my name, MikeMalatesta.com. You do that right now, put in your email address and you'll get the very next issue. The newsletter is short, thoughtful, and designed to inspire, activate, and maximize the greatness in you. 